What's going on folks? Now this is about the time that all the prepping channels come out with their dark winter videos. Dark winter's around the corner, dark winter's coming. This year is it, this winter is gonna be the year. Now I'll be the first to admit, with winter comes higher stakes, higher risk. It would be a really bad time for any country to lose their electric grid in winter, I get it. But with this channel having practical in its name, I'm gonna try to stick with the more probable. Now most folks are probably gonna be worried about a short term or maybe an extended power outage in the middle of winter. Now a power outage in winter is nothing to mess with. Don't get me wrong. And if you're truly worried about a dark winter, just take everything we talk about in the video and just get more of it. Beef up the volume and the number of supplies, whatever makes you comfortable, to get you through the coming months. And I'm not saying a dark winter isn't possible. One could be right around the corner. Who knows? But regardless of that, you need to have enough supplies to keep you and your family warm and keep your house in order. All I'm saying is let's not repeat what we saw in Texas last year. I mean, look at Europe in general right now. All the countries are trying to get off Russian gas. It's not going to be pretty when you have that high of a dependence on a country that's basically dangling over your heads. So we're going to jump into the video. If you like the video and you want to get it out to others, please hit the like button. If you want to see more content like this, feel free to subscribe. Let's jump in. Now some things you're going to want to have ready in your home, starting with warmth. It all starts with layers, layers of clothes, layers of blankets. Just focusing on layers, you're going to be in a really good position. Just trapping pockets of air in between fabrics is gonna keep insulating you from the outside ambient temperature. The rule of thumb with layers is a base layer, and this is gonna be really good at wicking moisture, keeping moisture off of your body, taking it away from your body as fast as possible. And the middle layer is gonna be the insulation layer. That's what's gonna keep you warm, followed by an outer layer, which is gonna buffer you from the windy, rainy conditions, the type of weather that is gonna get your clothes damp. It's gonna cut through the clothing with the wind. You wanna be able to protect yourself with an outer shell. Now wool is on the top of my list. It's going to be great in so many situations because it naturally captures thousands of pockets of air, which is perfect for insulation. It's going to be not only a great base layer because it's going to wick moisture off of your body and away from you, but it's also going to be a great insulation layer because of the natural insulation properties. It's hypoallergenic, it's fire resistant, and it regulates your body temperature. What more could you ask for? You can't go wrong with having a few space blankets on hand. You'd be able to throw them in a bag. They're super small and lightweight. You can throw one in a bag and forget it's even there. This could be great for combating hypothermia or reflecting heat from a fire or your own body heat in an emergency shelter of some kind. One thing to watch out for with these emergency blankets though, especially if they're the Mylar kind, they're not breathable. So if you go to bed in one of these, you may end up finding yourself sweating in the middle of the night. And that's not good for a couple reasons. One, you lose fluids that you want to keep inside your body at all costs. The other is you don't want your clothes getting damp in a situation where it is freezing cold outside. It's only going to make your body work harder to try to evaporate that damp, that moisture on your body, the sweat. And that's actually going to end up cooling you down, which is not the effect that you want. So keep your clothes dry at all costs in this kind of a situation, whether you're outside or inside. If you notice that you're starting to sweat, adjust your layers accordingly so that you stop. And sleeping bags are going to be great in any situation, really. Uh, perfect for a scenario like this. You go camping, you know, you're going to have sleeping bags on hand. And of course, there's a couple options to consider. There's down and there's synthetic. Down is going to have some really great insulation and compression properties. So you're going to be able to stay warmer in colder weather, more extreme weather. The problem with down, though, is that if it gets wet, it's game over. You lose a lot of the insulation properties. Let's just say you're gonna be really cold that night. And it's also gonna be a lot more expensive than other options. So that's gonna take it off the list for many people. The great thing about synthetic is that it's gonna be able to retain the insulation properties even if it gets wet. It's also a lot cheaper than down bags. Now, when you're not sleeping, you're gonna want some kind of device to heat the room, preferably not your whole house. There's a few options out there, a couple of those being kerosene and propane. And one of my favorite options is the little buddy heater. I've had one for the last 10 years. And the thing that I love about these is that they come with a low oxygen sensor. So it's one more safety check if you are in a smaller confined place. You don't want that carbon monoxide building up, displacing the oxygen. One thing I ended up doing with mine is I have a 20 pound tank that I use with the heater. And I would have an extension line that I got from the buddy heater. Some of the other adapter hoses that you buy could have oil within the hose that would actually end up clogging and gunking up the buddy heater. So I would just stick with the buddy heater adapter 
adapter for the 20 pound tanks. Every day, open up those blinds, get some fresh sunlight in that's gonna help heat your house from the inside. It's better than nothing. Now, if you have some source of power, whether it's a power station like a solar generator or even a gas generator, some form of power, you could use something like a low wattage heater. You just gotta remember that there's gonna be a limited amount of time that you can use something like this. So take, for example, you have a thousand watt hour power station. And in this case, the heater takes about 200 watts, right? So you're gonna take that 1000 divided by 200. You're gonna get about five hours, probably a little less, of heating time with that heating element. So that's what, the coldest part of one night and it's gonna be over, you're gonna be out of juice. So either have a lot of power and you use this in a real emergency or you have some kind of replenishable source like solar for your power station or a gas generator. You just need to be realistic about this option because you're not gonna have unlimited power. And if you do, kudos to you. And I have to say it because you know some folks are gonna to try to do this in a situation they're not gonna be thinking clearly, who knows. Do not, I repeat, do not use a gas generator in your house or even near your house. You're dealing with an odorless, tasteless, invisible gas. Don't mess around with this stuff. Keep a carbon monoxide detector wherever you go if you plan on using any combustible heat source. And of course, you're gonna to wanna to have some food and water on hand. So if you're planning for SHTF and you have years of food and water, you can just skip this step. But if you're not worried about the end of the world, hopefully you still have weeks to months of food and water just in case. My recommendation is if you have a tight budget, go for days to weeks of extra food. You just pick up some extra when you go to the store and go for two to three months if you have some more expendable income. And if money's not an issue, it's not a barrier, go for years, whatever ends up helping you sleep better at night. Regardless of the situation, plan on eating any of the food that you store. So plan on storing only the food that you're gonna eat. Think of food as an investment. You're gonna be putting money in now. It's going to be more expensive down the road. So as long as you eat the stuff, you're saving money. And similar for water, keep at least two gallons per person per day of water for drinking and you've got some hygiene. This is an emergency ration. I know a lot of folks in the comments are claiming that you can easily use five or more gallons and I believe it. But for emergency storage, I would say that's a bare minimum to have two. And most people probably don't have the storage space to store much more water than that, if that. So you're gonna have to do what you can. Now in a situation like this where you have freezing temperatures, if your water has any chance of being exposed to those temperatures and freezing, you're gonna to wanna to make sure to leave at least 10% headspace in whatever water containers that you're storing the stuff in. As the temperatures go down and the water starts to freeze, you're gonna have that 10% headspace that keeps your containers from exploding or cracking. If you can, move some of that water into whatever room that you're staying in. If you've isolated yourself to a room to stay warm, that's gonna be able to keep that water thawed and it's just gonna be easier to access when you need it. So you probably knew this already, but you can raise the temperature in a room, preferably smaller, with candles, like tea light candles, the ones that last for four hours. You can store a ton of them, they're light, they're super cheap, you can even cook with them. Now you're not gonna be bringing your soup to a rolling boil with this tea light candle, but you're gonna be able to cook food if you keep it on long enough. And Sterno's another great backup to have, along with maybe an alcohol stove. In the alcohol stove, you can use isopropyl alcohol, you can use denatured alcohol, heat, which is actually an automobile antifreeze. So you're gonna get quite a versatility out of something like an alcohol stove. And of course, don't forget about your gas stove. I would not use your gas stove for heating your house. That's just not something I would do. Unless you wanna ventilate, I, I just would wouldn't try it. Gas stoves are not meant for heating the house. They're meant for cooking food, so they're not designed for it. So because there's no electricity and the igniter's not gonna work, you would be able to take a flame like a lighter and hold it to your gas, right? Just like you would normally turn the stove on and light the stove that way. Again, just have a carbon monoxide detector close by. Now I'm big on power stations. I love the idea of having power stored in a big battery in case I ever needed it. Plus it's perfect for camping and other adventures. If you're looking for a power station for some kind of a power outage, I would stick to the one kilowatt or 1000 watts for a short term, maybe a day power outage. That's probably going to be more common for most people. But if you like me and you're prone to more extended as in a couple to few days of power outage, you may want to stick to something like a 2000 watt or greater. The great thing with these is that you can use solar to replenish the battery. You could use a gas generator. You could even use your car outlet. It's going to take a long time to replenish the battery in your power stations if you had to. Plus, similar to the low wattage heat, I mentioned earlier, you could use a low wattage cooker, electric cooker, you'll be able to plug into your power station 
and cook your food. You don't have to worry about fumes. You don't have to worry about getting choked out by carbon monoxide. Just again, be realistic about the amount of power that you have. You have a fixed amount of juice. Just keep that in mind when using an option like this. And if you plan on having light, make sure that you have batteries to go along with that light. Now, unless you have built-in rechargeable lithium iron batteries in some of these lights nowadays, you would have to have some alkaline batteries on hand, maybe some nickel metal hydride that you can charge later. Having any life-saving prescriptions or medications on hand is gonna be ideal. Now, if this was a dark winter situation, having multivitamins on hand and plenty of them would probably be a wise idea. And let's not kid ourselves. Emergency personnel have the same problems driving in snowy, icy, windy situations, especially with winter and the snowstorms and the blizzards that we're gonna be more prone to. Don't think that emergency personnel are gonna be able to get to your location as fast as they would otherwise. So you wanna have medical equipment that you can put into effect at a moment's notice. It's gonna take longer for these folks to get here to stop major bleeding, to open an airway. So having the equipment on hand, like a tourniquet, like a compression bandage, it's gonna help the situation. I'll plug a video where I built an emergency trauma kit if you're interested on doing it yourself. And for folks that have special equipment needs or a cooler to keep their medicine cold, you're gonna wanna consider that power station again if you don't already have one. There's so many options out there. You just wanna make sure that you get the right size for what you need. Now, if you find yourself in an extended power outage situation like a dark winter, you're gonna wanna consider the real danger of having your pipes freeze and possibly burst on you. If there is any doubt in your mind that this could happen, just turn the water off where it enters your home and open up a faucet at the lowest point in your house that's gonna get most of the water out of your system. And if you don't have the access or the ability to do that, you would be able to go to every faucet and just turn it on to where it's dripping or it's a very light stream of water. The constant movement of water is gonna make it so the pipes really can't ever freeze over unless it gets ridiculously cold. But the last thing you want is your pipes bursting in the middle of a situation like this. So just make sure you take that into account, depending on how long you've lost power. And if things got really bad to the point where you don't know when the power is coming back on, Think about setting up a microclimate. That should really be one of the first things you do if the situation is serious enough. You can set up a tent, you can just get a small room as small as possible. And the point of that being is you're gonna to wanna to only heat as much of a space that you need to. So setting up a tent, sleeping in that tent, having some sleeping bags, you'd be surprised at how much warmer that tent is gonna be than the outside ambient temperature. And you don't need a ton of expensive equipment to do this. Just take some blankets and some mattresses, the stuff that's gonna be in most homes. These are just some options I prefer. What are some others that you would have liked to see make the list? If you want a more definitive list on how to cook without power, check out this video here. I have a couple videos, it's actually a two-part series showing all the methods that I can think of and that I could find to cook without power. You gotta love free content, right? And if you wanna learn more about keeping warm in winter and actually saving some money while you do it, check out this video here. If you made it this far, you folks are amazing. That's a huge help with the algorithm, trust me. If you wanna see other types of topics, let me know in the comments. And until next time, stay practical.